Do you think you could be suffering from brain rot? Do you feel restless or bored even when you have lots to do? Are you less creative or is your memory worse than it used to be? Is your social media feed the first and last thing you see in the day? Do you find yourself neglecting your health because of your phone use? Or using your phone whilst you're driving? Having dinner with friends in silence because you're all on your devices? Do you find yourself scrolling for hours but unable to explain what you saw, let alone how long you were looking at it for? And realize that you've been doing this every day for as long as you can remember and it's gonna be like this from now on until the rest of your life. As each notification from the glowing screen pulls you further into the depths of idiocracy, the fragmented mirror of your screen reflects only a fractured self. Your phone, nothing more than a prosthetic mind that siphons the very essence of your attention, creativity and capacity for presence. You now exist in half-lives, your attention fractured into a thousand shallow moments. Like a snake swallowing its own tail, the incessant scroll feeds on the dopamine it dispenses, leaving behind a hollow shell of your former self that craves but no longer understands satisfaction. You call it content, but it is empty calories for the mind, devoured without reflection, without digestion. This is not evolution, it is entropy, the slow disintegration of the human mind. Well, I'm Dr. Curran, and you may have brain rot. It's the malady of our time and is the inevitable result of overconsumption of mindless content, poor nutrition, insufficient sleep and exercise, and the very thing that's controlling your attention right now. Our utter addiction to the internet. In the age of constant connectivity, the human brain is no longer the sole architect of thought. It has become a fractured collaborator with, or some might say, slave to the machine. Our neural networks honed by millions of years of evolution to adapt, survive and create have been rewired by algorithms, optimized not for our growth but for engagement. This isn't a metaphorical brain rot, it's literal neural degradation. The result? Skyrocketing levels of anxiety and depression, particularly in young people. The persistent feeling we are less cognitively capable than we used to be, as well as a decline in critical thinking as we spend more and more time in echo chambers that amplify our biases and polarize society. You might feel powerless to do anything about it, but it is possible to stop brain rot for good and get your life back on track. First, we need to understand how the hell we got here in the first place. Well, to answer that question, we need to go back in time 300,000 years to the beginning of our species existence. Now, I know this is going to be hard, so here's someone playing Minecraft to keep you entertained while I talk. Okay, so that was a joke. Sort of, but the sad reality is many of you would be more likely to watch this video if there was an extra stimulus of another video playing at the same time. Let's imagine the 300,000 years our species has existed is just one day. That means the oldest cave art we found was painted just over three hours ago. Writing was developed about 25 minutes ago. The oldest surviving theater was built 11 minutes ago. The internet's been around for 12 seconds. We've had iPhones for five seconds and TikTok was invented just two seconds ago. For most of those 300,000 years, our ancestors had no need for entertainment. Just finding enough food and avoiding being torn limb from limb by a wild beast was diverting enough. But just in the last few seconds of that day, for most of us, we no longer need to find our own food. We can now spend our time being entertained. And while most of our ancestors had to earn their entertainment with whatever games they could invent with sticks and stones, in the last few minutes of just one day of existence, we've invented theatre, books, music, all of which required time and effort to create and experience and generated slower but longer term reward. But in the last few seconds, we've traded all of that for the immediacy and superficiality of instant gratification from social media and the internet. Ideas that have percolated through humanity's collective mind for centuries have been sacrificed at the altar of virality to be replaced by the most inconsequential of fluff. For example, it might take you two weeks to finish a novel, but Netflix? 
all you do is sit down, switch it on, and plug into the saccharine dopamine-filled matrix we've created for ourselves. Now, you might think the more options for entertainment we have, the better. But let's try a quick thought experiment. Would you prefer four courses of different foods or four courses of the same food? When participants in studies are offered more of a food they've just had or the chance to eat something different, they usually choose the different food. In fact, one study found that participants given a variety of food ate 44% more than people given the same food in different courses. This is known as sensory specific satiety. Put simply, you get tired of eating the same thing pretty quickly, but if you're offered something else to eat, your hunger magically returns and you start eating again, which is why you always have room for dessert. Well, when our entertainment choices were limited to a few TV channels or just the films in our VHS collection, if you still remember those, it was always possible that sometimes we'd run out of things to watch and might just... I don't know, do something else. And then the internet came along. Back in the early days of the internet, people went online over their squeaky modems or desktop computers that were so big they needed their own room. At least until your mum wanted to make a call and told you to get off. Now we carry the entire internet around in our pockets in miniature supercomputers. It's the first thing we look at in the morning and the last thing we look at at night before we go to bed. And once you take work out of the equation, what are most of us spending huge amounts of time doing? Doing online. Of course, we're on social media. For nearly two and a half hours per day, or incredibly, a total of 500 million years for all social media users combined just in 2024. Why do we spend so much time on social media when we know it wastes time at best and makes us anxious and depressed at worst? All those For You pages use the data we willingly give them to deliver up precisely the content we want. Every ping, every notification or like triggers a surge of dopamine. This powerful feedback mechanism is what underlies many addictive behaviors, including the compulsion to check our phones every two minutes. I can see you doing that right now. Over time, the overstimulation desensitizes the brain, makes ordinary life feel dull by comparison. The result is a dependency on digital stimuli to feel even baseline satisfaction. And we don't have to do anything other than like, repost, and above all, swipe over and over again. Because what the platform wants more than anything else is for you to stay on that platform for as long as possible. That's why they'll give you exactly the content you want and there's no end to it. Sorry, you lingered on that raccoon video just a bit too long. You've earned yourself a place in the sixth circle of social media hell. Unlimited raccoon video recommendations. So you just sit down at the end of a tiring day, open your phone just to see what's trending. And before you know it, you've lost an entire evening to social media and you don't remember anything you saw. So are we doomed to endless scrolling? Are we hostages to social media? Yes and no. The most sinister part is that we've consented to this decay. We tap agree without reading. We swipe right without thinking. We doom scroll through crises as though staring long enough at the abyss of our screens will somehow make the chaos less real. In the process, we surrender our thoughts, our solitude, our capacity for boredom, the birthplace of creativity, to algorithms designed to commodify every flicker of our attention. In truth, brain rot is not a malfunction, it is the intended result. For the economy of the digital age thrives not on the enlightenment, but on distraction, on addiction, on erosion of critical thought. A populist glued to the screens is a populist too preoccupied to resist, to question, or even to dream. Perhaps the darkest irony of all is that in our quest to feel connected, to escape loneliness, we've become the loneliest creatures to ever exist. Tethered not to one another, but to an infinite void. The brain rots because it is no longer nourished by silence, by depth, by the real. And as the screen lights up, the light within us dims. Before I provoke any more existential angst or crises, to answer the question of, is brain rot inevitable? If you'd asked me a few years ago, I'd have definitely said, Yes. The first thing I need to say is that there is no one size fits all solution to brain rot. I'm going to share my personal story with you, but your life and circumstances are unique to you, so what worked for me may not work for you. During the pandemic, when I wasn't working in a hospital, I found myself stuck at home, unable to go out like so many of us. But rather than being an opportunity for reflection, it became an endless pilgrimage into the black mirror of human chaos. Inevitably, I found myself spending hours at night doom scrolling. It became my pandemic ritual. An untold number of hours spent doom scrolling at night, my mind too bored to care about what I saw, but too hooked to stop 
turn to mush. And paradoxically, the more I engage with online content, the lonelier I became. Rather than connecting me with my fellow humans, I felt more isolated than ever. And yet, little by little, I managed to wean myself off this digital teat we call the smartphone. The first thing I did was get a dog. Dogs are like newborn babies. They can't be ignored, and there will definitely be toilet malfunctions to deal with. So when a dog needs to go for a walk, you go for a walk too. This was just what I needed. Every day I got out of the house, walking shadow, which meant I got fresh air and exercise. Crucially, I wasn't looking at my phone, wearing earbuds, or getting any kind of digital stimulation while I was doing it. It was just me and shadow. Me reflecting on the slow decay of the human condition and shadow shitting and pissing wherever he took his fancy. Dogs were work wonders for the brain too. Petting them releases oxytocin, the so-called bonding hormone, and reduces cortisol, the stress hormone that doom scrolling positively feeds on. Dogs are messy and demanding, but also a reminder that joy can be simple. A wagging tail, a muddy walk, and the occasional look of pure, unfiltered love. The next thing I did was to pick up reading again. Before med school, I loved reading, but between the ages of 18 and 26, the only stuff I read was either medical textbooks or scientific research papers and even that took a backseat to the never-ending stream of digital junk I shot straight into my cortex. But when I made the effort to get back into reading novels, I discovered I loved it as much as I did when I was younger. Yes, it was hard, the first few pages were agony, but gradually something stirred. I could feel parts of my brain that had lain dormant for years being forced back into activity. Reading engages the prefrontal cortex, the seat of focus and decision making, and strengthens the neural connection that doom scrolling leaves to rot. It forces the brain into a kind of mental endurance training, rebuilding the very muscles that TikTok had atrophied. Every page was a victory. Five minutes that social media could never take back from me again. Plus, if nothing else, books don't come with the pop-up ads or comments from Gary in Sunderland. And sorry to any Garys in Sunderland, I'm sure you're perfectly nice. I also picked up a writing habit. It started out as just notes on medical research and other interesting stuff I didn't want to forget, but it very quickly became therapy. Writing encourages the brain's language centers and improves memory, but equally powerful, it forces you to control your thoughts and confront them. Thoughts you've been avoiding by swiping past them. And it's much cheaper than a psychologist. When I realized that other people might be interested in what I was learning, it transformed into a newsletter, which I still send out to 50,000 people every Sunday. It contains evidence-based tips to improve your health, as well as anything else I find interesting or I'm currently enjoying. If you'd like to receive it free, you can sign up in the link in the description and I send it out once a week and you can cancel any time you like. That writing habit and my newsletter ultimately led me to being offered a book deal, which then helped keep me busy for the next two years. Gardening was my next escape, a quiet rebellion against the digital world slow, messy, and indifferent to notifications. I've been growing fruit and vegetable for several months now, and as peaceful, calming pastimes go, it's pretty hard to beat. I'm recording this in December, so you'll just have to take my word that it's not normally as bare as this. And once I had all those extra ingredients, I needed to do something with them, so cooking was the next logical thing I took up. As a gut surgeon and someone deeply interested in the microbiome, I've always been interested in how what we eat affects our own personal fertilizer factors. Now I could pursue that interest directly whilst working on my creativity, skills, and focus at the same time. And at the end of it, you'd get food. Real food. Not the existential emptiness of an Uber Eats order that tastes indistinguishable from its packaging. I now have so many alternatives to my phone, I've got to the point where I literally have no idea which social media in-jokes are doing the rounds or what the latest culturally relevant memes are. Wordle's supposed to be quite good, right? That, uh, that's the thing. Either way, now that I have way more interests and hobbies to fill my time, I no longer feel like the years are just passing me by without even noticing them. I literally have a wider range of memories to draw upon than when all I did was scroll through social media. Finally, here's one last tip that arguably is the key to breaking free from brain rot. Embrace boredom. The whole point of social media is to prevent you from ever being bored by always giving you something to scroll on. Ironically, by allowing your mind to wonder, you activate the brain's default mode network responsible for problem solving and introspection. If there's a lesson to learn here, it's that escaping brain rot isn't glamorous. It's hard work and will take time, but it is possible. 
if I, a pandemic-saturated husk of a human being, could do it, so can you. The answer is not a digital detox or a weekend retreat. It might simply be getting some dirt under your fingernails, a wagging tail, and a pot of something simmering on the stove. There absolutely is not a problem with enjoying some mindless online content every now and then, but brain rot is not inevitable. It's a choice, albeit one made incrementally and insidiously, but you can choose to reclaim your focus, your creativity, and your humanity if you're willing to wrest back control from the machines we've made for ourselves. The question is not if we can stop brain rot, it's whether we care enough to try.